The Holler Kings, where the horrors Southern fried. Hello, it's me, Craig. And it's me, Adam. And we're the Holler Kings. The motherfucking Holler Kings. It's true. Thank you for joining us for another trip down the Bell Witch Lane. Adam. Sir. What film will be... Ugh. Adam. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. What film will we be discussing today? We will be discussing Bell Witch, colon, the movie. Crying out to the Lord. I've come for you, John. I will kill you. In the hills on your knees, a long time. true this is one you brought to the table yes as with all of them that we've been discussing this month for spooky for season. better or worse i brought them off to you <laughs> yes for better <clears throat> or worse uh, that, that's kind of weird i feel like you emphasize the worse a little bit <laughs> <laughs> so the next two movies that we're discussing in this series uh, I have to kind of apologize to the listeners because they'll be a little tough to find. Yes. They're almost regional movies uh, that probably very few people outside of Tennessee have seen. Uh, probably few people outside of the production team and cast have seen. <laughs> but that's okay. I mean, we're we're zeroing in on our lane, which right, is... This is a Bell Witch, so yeah, we got to be honest to it's, it. It's Bell Witch, and you know, we're a podcast about Southern horror, so you can't get much more Southern than this. Yeah. But uh, how can people attempt to find this movie? This is Bell Witch, colon, the movie from 2007. Yes. I know we may have talked about it on the last episode that uh, Vim... Vim Vimeo, V I M E O. Yeah, uh, I know you can buy or rent it on there, and that's honestly, I think, that's honestly, I think the only place really that I know of that you can find it. Yeah. It may be, I don't think it's streaming on any other services, even to rent or buy. I, I guess we won't really talk about this a really long time, just mm-hmm. because it is probably so hard to find and everything. So it'll yeah. be a little bit off the beaten path. Tell me your experience with Bell Witch colon the movie. Not not much. Uh, you know, this is this is just one that I came across. I don't even recall exactly how. It, I mean, this was what two thousand seven ish, nine ish, somewhere in that era. And it had to have been one that I just uh, discovered. That in, at this time period, I was really into finding like indie movies. I really loved the idea of direct source filmmaker to fan hand like i order it direct from them and they give it to me and i can watch it i really love the idea of that i still love the idea of that but i don't i don't follow it as implicitly as i did at this time i was really ravenous for it and so i was always on the hunt trying to find movies uh like independent no budget movies to uh you know seek out buy uh and watch so it had have been from that source, just trying to search it out and came across it at some point. Uh, so you've had, you have a physical copy of this, I do. correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. From, from the era, basically, it came out. Yeah. 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 How did you feel when you, when you watched this film? When I rewatched it this time? Uh, no, no, the first time. You, do you remember young Adam watching this film? I remember... I remember just kind of being like on middle ground with it. Yeah. Where I was just like, oh, okay, that was that was fine. Right. You know, it was all right. I didn't absolutely love it, but I didn't hate it or anything. Because, again, this was around the era of like when American Haunting came out. True. And um, 
loathing that movie so much. Uh, you know, you watch it and go, okay, well, that was better than that. So yeah, probably yeah. Yeah. Uh, how about now when you revisited it as a full fledged adult? Um, I have a little bit more notes, but yeah. uh, I still kind of feel moderately the same i yeah. feel especially at it kind of benefited us that we're doing this the third one because you know in the context of having seen american haunting and bell witch 2013 bell witch haunting 2013 this is light years better than them i would I, I think so well, and it's worth noting because i mean obviously american haunting had a real budget with real right. hollywood credentials and everything and even uh the bell witch haunting from 2013 you know, was backed by some kind of, I mean, asylum, yeah. right? So it had some kind of grounding in, uh, you know, studio filmmaking. <laughs> yeah. uh, whereas this is just, I'm assuming, speaking out of turn a little bit, I don't really know. I assume this is made by mostly amateur filmmakers right. or indie yeah. filmmakers, I guess would be a more appropriate way to put it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that were local to Tennessee and probably pretty close to the legend and stuff like that. So, right. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, this was all, this is a, 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 from a company that's based in Tennessee. I think, I, I did, you know, filmmaking at this point of like, narrative feature i don't think is what they commonly do i think they do other stuff like services and maybe you know shooting like video packages for companies and stuff like that yeah Yeah, this isn't what they mainly do so it is a pretty indie kind of so it's almost like um george romero taking a shot with night of living dead when he was kind of a documentary slash educational filmmaker yeah yeah it's a little bit like that yeah and i mean before i Get into it. Yes. I do want to acknowledge that I do think this was a sincere attempt, for sure, to, to to lay this this story out and be accurate to the legends and folklore that so many people from Middle Tennessee are familiar with. Um, so I don't want to be way too hard on this, just mm-hmm. because I, I don't think this was some kind of weird cash grab or anything. I think this was a sincere attempt to kind of document these stories as they had heard it. And everything. Yeah, I feel like this was a. An honest attempt at making a solid movie yeah. about the legend of the Bell Witch from people that, as far as I know, like I said, it's a Tennessee company, as far as I know, and as far as I know, everybody in the, you know, behind the scenes and stuff are from Tennessee. Yeah. So I think it's just that love letter to the legend that we've all kind of grown up with. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I will say, I really appreciated the framing device, the, the idea that, because uh, uh, in the legends, the witch eventually tells some of the ancestors like, Hey, I'm going to return, you know, at this time and this time and so on to the most direct descendant. And one of the dates was in the 1930s. Yeah. Which was, yeah. Yeah. Cause it kind of starts with that, a sort of cold open, but it's in what it was in 1935. It says, so yeah, it kind of fits that point of when it was supposed to happen. And, and by legend, no one knows what did go down because the most yeah. direct descendant never publicly talked about it or anything like that. Right. So yeah. uh, that's totally open to speculation. So it was a kind of a clever idea. And honestly, I think there is a movie to be made in the 1930s dealing with that idea. You know, that way you could kind of make it your own, but yeah. still kind of yeah. use some of the elements that are interesting about the Bell Witch. But that that's just kind of a cold open, like you mentioned, and then kind of goes into the traditional story of, you know, the 1817 to 1821 events that we've discussed. So how did you feel about it? Uh, I mean, obviously I had a lot of problems with, like, it's obvious they had a little bit of money to spend on this thing, right? Yeah, it looks like, I mean, again, from it being a video production company, I guess they do keep up with the you know technology as it advances so they did have like hd cameras and all that and because this had to kind of be that forefront of when that was really becoming popularized especially on like a prosumer or like an indie level yeah so well and and it's some of that is on screen because i feel like the costumes the costumes and the vehicles that they use they're good but it's clear that they couldn't do whatever they wanted to with them yeah. because it, it's all pristine. Like the car that they're driving in the opening 1930s scene, it is gleaming. Mm-hmm. It's obviously a collector's car or whatever. They couldn't do anything to kind of like 
make it look like a lived in vehicle. Right. That always, that stuff always really jumps out to me. Um, especially cause these are supposed to be like regular dudes in Tennessee in the 1930s. So I just yeah. don't feel like their car would be that. I mean, where you, this is like a mirror when you look at it. Um, and then the costumes are almost all pristine. Like they're white gleaming, right, yeah. you know, and some of them are very colorful and, uh, I think they got a lot of the historical things a little wrong, but that's, you know, I mean, this is like based on folklore. So I understand people can kind of run with it however they want, but there is like bluegrass music from the opening moment to the last possible second of the credits or whatever. And that, that can kind of jump into my biggest problem with the movie. Yeah. It, and it, it kept taking me out of it is that, I just can't. Does this movie know what time period it's in? It, it, this movie, from the music to a lot of the, even a lot of the dialogue, feels like it should be set in like 1950s or something. I, I think that's definitely. I, I was going to say the exact same thing. I almost feel like they should have just made it their own and mm-hmm. set it in the 1950s yeah. and just kind of like said, "Hey, this is a spin on the Bell Witch. These are, you know, similar stories. We're just kind of running with it." Because, yeah, the dialogue, it sounds like Mayberry. I mean, it sounds like, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a 1950s, 1960s TV show, the, the way everyone speaks. And it's kind of done in a overwrought uh, southern accent and everything. It's pretty thick. Honestly, sometimes we're the worst offenders of this uh, because it's probably somewhat authentic but amplified because they're on camera. So it's people kind of like, yeah, I feel like shucking and jiving a little bit because a camera is on them. So they amp up you know, accents and everything. I, I'm not really convinced that people in the 18 teens, 1820s spoke that way. I wouldn't uh, think they would, you know, that it was like straight up how Southerners spoke in the 1950s in modern era to a certain extent. Bell farms up the road a piece. Now you boys ought not be going up there. I mean, they're one of the opening sequences is like a hoedown that they're having with a band, with a band playing it, I mean, it full on feels like a ho- like it's yeah. supposed to be like a barn dance or something. And, and like, I I I'm not a historian. I'm talking out of my ass. So please feel free to correct me in the comments. But I, I just don't think I feel like 1817 uh, Baptist in rural areas would almost be puritanical. Like I don't feel like yeah. they would be having that sort of barnyard dance type of thing, especially with that type of music. I, I'm pretty confident that that music didn't even exist yet in, that, that's in what the way I was, that they presented it. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, too, like, while watching it. I kind of, same thought as you, like, I'm not a historian, neither. I don't, I wouldn't even pretend to kind of know that type of stuff, but that that doesn't feel like a, a genre of music that was around yet. There's a movie, Elvis's first movie is called Love Me Tender. It's a Western Uh and it's his very first acting role. And even though it's a Western, they feel the need to insert a musical number. So there's a moment where he is like on stage performing for young girls in a Western and he's playing rock music. Like it's an acoustic guitar. Yeah. It, It theoretically could have happened, but he's doing his exact, he's gyrating, he's doing his whole shtick. I mean, they have Elvis, of course they're going to do it. But that's what this reminded me of sometimes where it just felt, it's like, yeah, it's possible. It's, it's possible these things happened, but it is, it seems so inauthentic. Bell Witch the Movie. Now you can own them all on the soundtrack from Bell Witch the Movie. This soundtrack has received praise from the country and bluegrass community and has been compared to Oh Brother Where Art Thou. Hear these great songs from Jimbo Whaley and Greenbrier, Valerie Smith and Liberty Pike, the Jeff and Vita Band, the Jeanette Williams Band, Becky Buller, and the Wells Family. A must own, soon to be classic. Well, we're kind of putting this critique on it. I personally... I thought the music was great. I loved all of it. Every yeah. every song that they had, because I'm pretty sure it was a lot of like like indie bands and singers from that. Uh, it's like Jimbo and yeah. um, Jimbo Whaley. Yeah, I think. yeah. Because yeah. spoiler, the credits to this movie are like 27 minutes long because it it lists every song because they're all original songs right. for this film yeah. and they're 
they're shoved into this movie. I mean, like there, there are so many musical sequences. There's music in the background all the time. It's there's really very rarely a moment where you can just breathe because there's all this crammed music in. Mm-hmm. And it's probably the Elvis parallel. Again, they probably had really talented people making music and just thought, well, we're using all of this. Yeah. I mean, we're not going to let any of this go to waste. And I kind of sympathize with that impulse, but as a casual viewer, it, it is it, just it like, hurt, dude, it hurts come on. The, like, it hurts the movie. Yeah. The the music I thought was fantastic. Yeah, I agree. But it, it hurts the tone of what the movie should be. I don't know what it maybe because this is like based on a true story. Theoretically, I mean it's based on real people. Yeah, and folklore. So you, yeah. yeah, so you should. If, I feel like because you know you can look at something like Django Unchained. Yeah. Where they have like rap music playing in, and it doesn't fit the tone of the time period at all but i mean it's a fictionalized story yeah so should be if this was like a completely made up different story maybe it would work better but since it's this true legend about you know real people it feels like it just throws everything off well i think if they had used it sparingly it could have been fine to Mm -hmm. to, to have more modern style music that because because it it is authentic in terms of it's from the region sure sure. you know what i mean so i could almost kind of see you arguing like oh we could have some kind of modern music to sort of help tell the story and and, although sometimes the lyrics were so on the nose that i was a little bit like it was pretty it was pretty hardcore i mean it was almost like craig fixes a donut (laughs) you know what i mean it was like very just like this is literally what is happening type stuff but but I think the, the the problem is they set the tone of they showed people in the film doing that music. So to me, that threw it all off completely. Maybe like, that's what it is. You know what I mean? Like as soon as you see real characters playing modern music, every time that modern music is brought back up into the narrative, it almost feels inauthentic no matter how you use it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think they set a bad tone, a, de- a bad precedent early on. I want to say real quick, it's going to get us off topic just a little bit. Uh, uh-huh. uh, the biggest hi- historical inaccuracy in this movie, you want to guess? Uh, I haven't. No, I have no idea. There is not one black person in this movie. The Bells really? owned a shitload of slaves. Yeah, that's Everyone true. in this region that they were friends with probably owned slaves. Bat, Be- Kate Batts definitely owned slaves. Y- there's not one black face in this movie. Yeah, yeah I think... They must have just been like, we don't want to touch that. I mean, and that's that's fair as well. Like they they wanted to tell because they are definitely type. telling. Their, while they're basing it on the legend, they are telling their own version of right. it. Right, right. So, so that's just that's just one thing that kind of popped out to me when, when I was just because <laughs> we just had a spillage over here. We're, we're always drinking sweet tea on this podcast, so I've only been doing it for thirty eight years. Do you think I'd have it down by now? <laughs> But that's just one thing, just reading so much about this stuff and then just knowing the main sources of some of this folklore are attributed to enslaved people. You know what I mean? Dean especially. You know, so many stories are attributed to him. So it's just kind of weird to sidestep that completely. I honestly think another talented filmmaker could make a story completely about the slaves in this story. Yeah. It's never even been touched. But, I mean, Dean has so many interesting stories. I think someone with some real integrity and that wants to tell an original story could take that and make it their own. Mm-hmm. And it could be a really cool and, and also kind of like, uh, you know, d- just an angle. No one's touched on any level, uh, let alone the bell, Witch. but I mean, I just don't feel like I've seen a ghost story concerning black people of that era. And, and I feel like that could be just like super terrifying and uh, you know, ghost, ghost stories by candlelight, I think have been kind of neglected lately. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's all pretty modern stuff or throwback to the eighties. You know, I think there's a good market to try to like recapture those, you know, candlelight ghost stories again. Um, anyway, I'll get off my, well, no, my I, podium I agree. Here. And you could really touch on some topical issues with that too. And, but yeah, if, if nothing else, Watching all these Bell Witch movies, we came, we come out of it with two good ideas for some movies based mm. on it. Yeah. So, what's the other? 
the setting it in the 1930s and oh, making up yeah. our own story. That's of just it. been yeah. untouched. I, yeah. yeah, I'm shocked that someone that doesn't love the folklore hasn't tried to you know make a fictional version of what may have happened. And then you could even uh, you know have the Bell Witch declare another year they're going to show up. You could make it a little franchise if you mm-hmm. wanted to. You know, it, it shows back up in the 1970s or whatever. Yeah. You know, or the heydays of the 80s and 90s. And it's, so it's it's like the Amityville horror because you can just anybody can make a movie based sure. on it. So sure, you just have a huge amount of them. <laughs> <laughs> Cut to us in five years. We're just making asylum movies. <laughs> um, Hit us up, asylum. <laughs> Another thing that j- jumped out to me, John Bell in this movie has like super sculpted uh, he, facial hair. Yeah. I thought it was like, so hilarious. You could tell he went to the barber the day before <laughs> for sure. I mean, he has like one of those, it's almost like an R&B singer, like the straight line that he has on his beard line. It's so <laughs> funny. And I was like, no one wore their, their beard like that in that era. And yeah, he has like no. very manicured eyebrows uh-huh. as well that are very metrosexual. And it just, I was like, okay, John Bell is supposed to be pushing 70. He's a farmer, you know, well-to-do guy. He just wouldn't, I mean, this dude is way too young. Mm -hmm. He's way too put together for the era. Uh, You know, it's just very badly cast, I feel like. He he is a good actor. Yeah, yeah. He's fine fine. as an actor. I don't mean to pile on him too much. But yeah, he does not look like he should. (laughs) It's really funny. It's funny with all these movies, because we were talking about how, you know, maybe they didn't want to touch on the topic of, like, slavery and stuff like that. I feel like all these movies so far uh, don't really touch on the age gap between Mm -hmm. Lucy and John. Because in all of them, they kind of look to be the same age, or, you know, Mm -hmm. roughly. None of them want to touch on that. I guess it's just like they don't want to touch it, because they all look... Roughly like they could be around the same age, maybe a few years apart here and there. Well, but. in in this movie, all the ages are fucked up. I mean, no, For sure. no, none of the ages are appropriate because Betsy... When yeah, the, she looks like she's like 18. Sure, she looks yeah. like a full-grown woman, and she's supposed to be 12 when it all starts. Yeah. Um, and then the boy, Williams, that is kind of framing the story in so many ways, uh, when it started, he was six years old. Mm-hmm. And they make yeah, it seem like he's a preteen. Yeah, he's like, like 12, 12 or something. Yeah. Um, which he kind of was towards the end of it, but they make it seem like from the outset. Which, again, low budget. They can't just cast six different people for all these parts. Like, I understand that. Another thing, Betsy's costuming. How'd you feel about that? Um, I, I, I didn't take she, too much note of it. I mean... my my The funniest thing to me about... There's this scene that just seemed so out of place where Joshua is asking Betsy to marry him. And she's like, no, we can't. We're so young. We need to wait. I'm like, that's not that conversation in 1817. Like, I'm like, again, that's a conversation in the 1950s where, no, let's wait. Let's wait a while. We're so young. No, at that at that time, we're like, I'm pushing 14. I got to get married. I don't know. It felt weird, but. It, the costume. Well, I mean, again, I, I'm projecting here. I don't know this, mm-hmm. but I'm assuming that Baptist in the eight, 1817, 1821 would be puritanical yes. in how they dressed. Betsy is almost always showing cleavage. That's true. I mean, she's dressed yeah. like Christina Ricci and Sleepy Hollow For style. For sure. Where it's like, you know, how modern goth women dress w- when they're really going for it or whatever. Yeah. And uh, she has bottled red hair, Mm -hmm. you know, and it just really jumps out in a movie that is kind of stepping forward as though they're historically accurate just to kind of go for it in that way. And also, I mean, like in scenes with uh, Professor Powell, where he's like (laughs) chewing scenery, trying to like seduce her. Oh, my God. There was some like like, uncomfortable moments. That's one thing that I found interesting. You can kind of watching these back to back. The perspective of, like, what does this filmmaker want to focus on? Yeah. Because you, you look at, like, an American haunting, and they're like, Professor Powell is a hero. He's yeah. so great. And this one is like, oh, he's a nefarious, he's a evil scuzzy dude. Scuzzy dude, yeah. Everybody, oh, everybody. And there are some uncomfortable scenes. I mean, we, we I guess I'll have to go back and try to drop a little bit of this stuff into the body of the podcast, because otherwise mm-hmm. people aren't going to have context for a lot of it. 
but I mean, there's a scene where he's just straight up trying to seduce her, and it's so yeah. like it, it. It's very uncomfortable, and what's really uncomfortable about it is that she's receptive to it. There's no like she seems like really taken aback and impressed with him doing this, you know, and it's yeah. just kind of like. Professor, what are you doing here? I picked these just for you. Thank you. This is so nice of you to come by. What did I do to deserve these? Well, if I recall, I wrote you some very nice letters and you never responded back. You broke your promise. I know you read my letters. I did get a few of your letters. Oh. Professor, I just didn't know what to say. And Joshua and I, well, we just broke up yesterday. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Betsy, come on. You know he's not the one you want. Come on. Come on. You know he's not the one you want. I mean, it's kind of hilarious, but I don't know if that's what they were going for. You know, I don't know how what the tone was really. Yeah, I don't. Know, I don't for. know what exactly they were going for, but it was really, it was really oh. uncomfortable. I was like, oh, this is. But yeah, they. It's kind of interesting because they completely paint him as like a nefarious, like John Bell doesn't like him, and Joshua doesn't like him, and pretty much. The only person that has no problem with him in this movie is Lucy and Betsy. Right. But everybody else is like, there's something wrong with that dude. There's something off about him. What, one other thing I wanted to point out were the transitions. The, the, the wipes? Yeah. Oh, my God. It's like Star Wars. I don't yeah. know why. They're, and they do the whole thing with like... Uh, it's not just regular wipes. It's like stylized wipes yeah. where it like, uh, you know, turns into a circle and zeroes in on someone, mm -hmm. you know, spotlight style. And it's very, very, strange. it's very like sitcom -y. Yeah. But yeah, this, this, this has like really strange transitions that again are very jarring because they're very of its era. It's very much so someone that just got new editing software and they're playing around with it. Yeah. And they got that toaster from the 90s in there. It, it's like, uh, let's use a star wipe. Yeah. Star wipe. Everything is a star wipe. You know, it's like that over and over. And it just does not fit a historical, you know, period piece. One thing we have forgot, we have shamefully not pointed out yet, is that the one and only Betsy Palmer does the voice of the witch yeah, in final, this. Final screen appearance is yeah. this film. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, tell us who Betsy Palmer is. For she it. is the one and only Pamela Voorhees. Mm. You see, Jason was my son, and today is his birthday. I mean, I forgot that she was in it. Well, she's not in it. She does the voice, but I forgot she had a part in this movie until re-watching it. Mm. Uh, how'd you, what'd you think of that? I mean, I could take it or leave it. I, I yeah. don't. I feel like she was squandered a little bit. Yeah. You know, I'm kind of like you, middle of the road with. It. I thought it was fine. I, yeah. I, I mean, thought she did a fine job and everything. When when I saw her name in the cast, I was hoping she was gonna like be on screen. Same so here. that was kind of a bummer. Uh, just it's just her voice. But yeah, I thought it was fine overall. I got a call from my agent, and he said, um, "There's some people want you to do a voiceover in a movie called The Bell Witch." And he said, you don't want to do that, do you? And I paused for one second and I said, why wouldn't I want to do it? And he said, well, he said, it's a voiceover and you have to fly to California. And I said, no, I said, I do want to do it. One thing I, I did want to mention was, I mean, they, they, they go hard for the myths in the mm -hmm. folklore. They try to give us pretty much every highlight that is in Ingram's book, like the classic source of so many of these stories. Yeah. Um, and they just do it step by step. I mean, they almost do it chronological order. So, I mean, and that part of it was well done, but it almost illustrates why this is such a hard movie to make. Yeah. Because the stories are so, they're almost esoteric. Sometimes they're not related. There's never an official source of what the Bell Witch is. So they're just kind of throwing it all out there and letting you as a viewer kind of piece it together, I guess, or just kind of take it or leave it. You know? Right. 
one thing I thought was really funny were the moments where it, it showed the weird creatures mm-hmm. that they were hunting or whatever. Because yeah. they were just real world animals that uh, the people of that era wouldn't be familiar with. Which I thought was an interesting way to kind of go with it because they probably didn't have the budget to make some kind of weird puppet or CGI creation or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there's the, the first thing that they encounter, which was supposed to be a dog animal with a rabbit head mm-hmm. is just like a real life weird animal that really exists. <laughs> I forgot what it was in the video. We can throw that in. Um, but it's just funny because it like cuts to this animal just kind of frolicking <laughs> and then they're all freaking out, taking aim at it and shooting at it and it cuts back to it and it's just kind of like, hi. Like it, it almost looks like that um, that suspicious gopher meme, that thing that's like dun, dun, dun. Oh, yeah. You know, it almost yeah. looks like one of those creatures but a little bit bigger. So it's like very comical unintentionally. And then there's a buzzard later that mm-hmm. they use or some kind of condor. Or some, it's, yeah, it's some a, type of bird like yeah. that. Really large bird, pretty actually pretty disturbing looking. So that actually kind of worked. That for wingspan what they were going was for. pretty hardcore. Yeah. So what did you? How did you feel about the overall haunting of it and their uh, physical manifestation of the witch? Because they, they, they do all these, like they do have like a woman that actually physically plays mm-hmm. the witch in the movie. They have all these elements of like green light that kind of shines oh, through yeah. like cracks and crevices that kind of is supposed to be a signifier of the witch. How, how, how do you feel about that part of it? Well, I mean, it's a little bit hit or miss uh, for the era. I think it kind of worked. Um, the green light, e- even though it's very modern, it at least kind of fits in thematically because one of the images that Betsy sees early on is a girl in a green dress. Yeah. So, so at least there's some kind of thematic, you know, tie in with it being green light representing the spirit or whatever. The, the only thing that, that kind of got me with it is nobody ever really sees the green light or they don't, no, they, they don't, don't really comment on it, it at all. It's probably it's, post. Yeah. I mean, stuff, I guess right? it's, it's just for the audience, I guess, uh, but it doesn't seem like, it doesn't seem like anybody really notices it. Yeah. How did you... F- I mean, what about the physical manifestation, you know? thought it was a little weird. Mm. It almost looked like they were, like, uh, Bride of Frankenstein in her a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I can see with that. With, like, the hair and everything and the dress. I don't know. It, again, with with this legend, it just seems sort of unnecessary. With with plenty of other ghost stories, it would it would maybe work a little bit better. Although she, her look is a little comical with the hair and stuff, but it it just it didn't feel like it fit fit the tone of it really to yeah. me. No, I agree. I mean, again, just knowing what they were working with, I, yeah. I kind of sympathize. But yeah, it did, it did kind of fall flat. Um, I think they would have been better off sticking with the legend, doing a disembodied voice strictly. Mm-hmm. One thing I meant to mention about Richard Powell's classroom. Did you notice the chalkboard? Yes. It, it literally, uh, his chalkboard, there's several scenes in this classroom where, where Powell is teaching. The chalkboard never changes. In mm-hmm. the background, it just has the alphabet and the, the numbers 1 through 10. <laughs> and, you know, hello class. Yeah, it has like a name you know. on there and yeah. stuff. Yeah. And it's just like. You know, this is a classroom full of like preteens to late teenagers that he's probably been teaching, being their only teacher for years. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we're to believe that he just teaches them the alphabet and the numbers <laughs> one through ten every day. It uh, you was know. 1817, I guess. I mean, and like also, uh, even if it was a reference point, I mean that that's the only reference point that he has to help help him teach. It's yeah. like you know he's trying to teach them fractions or something. He's like, don't forget. One through ten, guys. You know what I mean? Or like, you know, he's trying to teach them like uh, pronouns or whatever. And he's like, all right, don't forget. God damn it, I told y'all a hundred times. Alphabet. (laughs) These are the building blocks. This is all you fucking need is this shit right here. Why can't I get it through your heads? Yeah, it it just really was comical. You look great, Betsy. (laughs) You know you don't want him. (laughs) <laughs> oh man oh, oh god just seeing this grown man <coughs> you know which technically he's probably only like a few years older than the actress playing betsy but whatever yeah yeah it, they're actually kind of in the right age bracket in real life but uh 
it's just funny seeing him like try to like cock block this very <laughs> what's presented as this very fanciful true romance between these young people and he's just like he's like Servius Snape from like you know from For Harry sure. Potter yeah. just like uh, oh one other casting coup is uh they 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 totally do the Andrew Jackson uh story I think this is the only movie that touches it that that we watched I'm pretty sure that that actually yeah, literally so. shows Andrew Jackson yeah. showing up because that's a really popular legend. Uh, but what's hilarious to me is I don't know if they just ran out of actors or what, but they pick a man that looks nothing like Andrew Jackson. Not even close. Andrew Jackson. They he, had to point out it's Andrew Jackson because sure. otherwise you would not know whatsoever. I mean, even like the average American that just knows what he looks like from the $20 bill is yeah. going to be like, what? Like, w- what's happening? But as a Tennessean, I mean, Andrew Jackson is tall. He's thin. He has like this really dramatic you know, sh- white hair like that, you know, type yeah, thing. I mean, it's yeah. like very pronounced and very, you know, but, but the man that they cast, he is overweight. He's not the appropriate age range, uh, for that era. And he's not a good actor. Like he, he botches the line and he, he doesn't do a very good line reading. Cause at first when I saw him, I was like, wow, they got a heavyweight, a heavy set person to play Andrew Jackson. That's weird. But I was like, Oh, maybe he's a good actor. And that's why they cast. But then he just, He's very flat with yeah. his line reading. So I don't know if he was like a last minute replacement. They had someone else. Oh, fuck. We forgot the Andrew right. Jackson call, call Cooter, you know, and they just had some <laughs> random dude show up, yeah. you know. I mean, he's not horrible, but it's just so miscast right, and so strange, right. you know. Yeah, it was, it was definitely an odd thing, and you could hear it in the dialogue. It's like, oh, hi, Andrew Jackson. How are you doing, Andrew Jackson? Right. I'm glad you're Andrew Jackson. Right. And they establish in the dialogue uh, somewhat more organically that, some of John Bell's sons served with Andrew Jackson. Right. They, they kind of bring that up a couple of times, so there's a little bit of connective tissue that, so it's not just like abrupt <laughs> Andrew Jackson showing up. <laughs> but it is, I mean, that scene was just like. Yeah, because they, they yeah. did early on kind of, like, I'm pretty sure it was in the little barn dance scene that right. they're talking about uh, yeah. how, because they're like, I forget which son it is. Um, yeah, I'm not sure off the top of my head. It's, but it might be Junior, John Bell Junior. Maybe. Yeah. But they're like, "Oh, you're back," you know, mm-hmm. and talking about fighting with oh, Andrew yeah. Jackson. And and he's like, that. "I saw some bad things," and like one of the pastors is all like, "Come talk with me over, over yeah, here about yeah. this, that whole thing." Yeah. There is one scene that just was hilarious. The Kate Bats of it all. Mm. Um. There's one scene where the the witch's um, voice comes into the uh, church and starts um, like raising some hell, Yum. and Kate. Everybody's like, "Oh, oh God, no!" Oh. And Kate <laughs> Betts is in there, just like, <laughs> just, just laughing and right, like, right. "Oh yeah, yeah, yeah." yeah. <laughs> it's like, I, what were they doing? Is it? Uh, are they trying to be like it was her all along or something? Well, I, I will. Th- I mean, I think that this movie it doesn't want to make its own decision about what the Bell Witch legend is. Yeah. So it kind of gives you several different options, and you're just supposed to kind of pick one, I guess. It's like choose your own fate type of thing. For um, sure. C- and I think that's another flaw of the movie. You have to weigh in. I feel like if you're making a narrative film about this, you have to have some kind of angle to, to satisfy a viewer. I mean, you want to tell a story. You know, like this isn't a documentary. This isn't just laying out the legends. It's supposed to tell like a story with a structured story on some level. And I think yeah. that's where this it's a major fail for, for this film. Mm-hmm. I mean, it just, it's almost a series of events. It doesn't really tie in as a story that satisfies, although they do try to punch out with an interesting ending. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, tell us, tell us how they stick the landing on this, uh, um, uh, this, uh, story stick the landing. Uh, well, I guess <laughs> Wh- which point are you refer? Are you referencing the almost like cold ending or the actual ending to the, Bell Witch Saga. Oh, I meant the the 1820s okay, era. Yeah, yeah. It does this odd thing where unnecessarily we find that John Bell was buried alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was a weird now, thing to punch out on. He was poisoned, and this is an era where people were buried alive sometimes. For sure. So it's possible. I mean, yeah. and there and it's 
up, you know, again, they're filmmakers. They can kind of run with it. I do think it was hilarious that they gave them matches, though. Yeah, that, that, that <laughs> yeah, I was uh, matches with them. Like, oh, I'm alive. I'm alive. You we know? got, we got to bury this dead man. Make sure you give him his matches first. <laughs> He might need those in the afterlife. That that was that was strange. I was like, "That's that's okay. Well, all right, I guess. <laughs> sure, why not?" Yeah, I mean, it, it played as comical to me too. It did. It, it was, it, it was it pretty did. hilarious. It was kind of it was kind of ridiculous, kind of over the top with it. But tell us about the wraparound story. You mentioned they punch I, out on a totally yeah. Different... They punch out on sort of its modern times and a family are coming to move into the house. It's kind of one of those things of like, I guess the mother daughter are like, no, we're not going in there. And the dad's like, no, come on, let's go, let's go. And that's kind of how it just kind of goes out, fizzles out at that point in the end. Seemed like a even more unnecessary step than the John Bell demise. Yeah, I mean, I, I like that they try to do a framing device. Like I like the 1930s bit and everything. Right. But I re- guess you could say like here... Cold open in the 1930s, then we go back to the original story, and here's the Bell Witch coming back again in modern times. Right. Maybe maybe it's what they were going I for. Mean, I, I didn't feel like it translated completely, but maybe that's what they were going for. It did, I agree with you that it didn't really work, but I, I kind of appreciate the attempt yeah. to kind of make it their own a little bit. So for me, it was kind of like middle of the road where they didn't quite make it work, but I I really see what they were going for. You for know what sure. I mean? What did you think of Bell Witch colon the movie? Um... I, you know, I thought they made a valiant effort, uh, even though they came up short in a, in a lot of ways, at least for me personally. Um, I think I'd, I want to be fair to it. Um, I know they, with a low budget like this, they had a lot of short, you know, a lot of stuff that they couldn't do that they probably wanted to do. A lot of having to make sacrifices and stuff. I'm going to give it a C-. minus. Yeah. I feel like that's pretty fair. I, I didn't feel. I feel like it's not a bad movie, but it leaves a lot to be desired as well. Again, I feel like if the same group of people, the cast and crew and the writers, director, if they had zeroed in on a different time era and just took Bell Witch as an inspiration, they may have made a pretty decent movie. If if they had you done know, like you said. And set it in the 50s, I think this would have worked so much better. This yeah. whole story would have worked so much better being in like the 30s or 40s or 50s. It would have, I mean. I mean, I wrote down one line where I was like, I cannot believe someone on. Oh, because this has the pins. We missed, we totally oh, sidestepped yeah, that. We forgot all about this that. This has like a sequence where the young kids in the Bell family discover a cave and there is a body underneath the cave that has all these pins stuck in it. Yes, look like almost look like some kind of like fancy acupuncture pins yeah. or something. And there's a bunch of them and one of the boys steals one of these pins. Oh, he steals a whole bunch of the, them. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he yeah. gets a whole handful of them. And they kind of insinuate that that's like the source of why things go bad, but they don't really explain it, which yeah. is maybe a good idea. Yeah, that's fair. Um but there is a line where they're showing, you know, like the, these p- fancy pins to some classmates, and a boy says, "I ain't never seen nothing like that before," <laughs> and, it, and it just like it just killed me. Like I was like, "No, the people didn't talk that way." Like I just yeah. don't buy it. I mean, I don't know, but just, I don't. I don't. I just, could coming from, I mean, that time frame coming all from. Like England and Europe and stuff, I just, I don't see that being the accent at that point. I mean, it it just it felt very Mayberry slash Little Rascals type yeah. of thing going on, and it bugged me. I, I mean, mean, even if they had set this movie in the thirties or fifties or whatever, the accents would have still seemed over the top. Yeah. but they just are completely out of place in the night in eighteen seventeen. I mean, and for better or worse, that's film language. I mean, we're just used to people in certain eras on film speaking a certain way. For sure. So, I mean, that, that might not be their fault completely, but that's unfortunately that's you know a, a cross for them to bear when they're making a movie like this. And I guess we'll never know because you know we don't have any indication of whatever anybody sounded like back then. Yeah. But you, I, I just take it from in the way you can see how people would write and things like that. I just don't see that being the accent they would have. Yeah. You know? Okay. But anyway, but anyway go, yeah. going back to the grading, I mean, 
even with the sliding scale and everything, I have to acknowledge this would be a slog for someone that wasn't interested in Bell Witch. It's, it's an hour and like 39 minutes. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a tough watch. And I did look at IMDb, a few of the comments and stuff like that, where people were just vicious on this movie. So I could see an unsuspecting viewer walking into this just wanting like a ghost story and being like, what the fuck is this? Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So as an, for an outsider, I would say D minus. Where it, like there is some genuine intent, and like I'm not trying to just totally thrash these people because I think you know it was a real effort. Yeah. And not not some kind of cash grab or soulless or whatever. But I, I just don't feel like it translated very well. Like the ideas that they had and nothing really works. All the pieces are interesting, but don't really work together. You know? Yeah. You got a beautiful puzzle, but it's not put together. Yeah. And, and, and I, and it's a shame because I, I don't think any of these people have mo oh, the bulk of the people behind the scenes don't really have any major credits beyond this. Mm -hmm. So there is a piece of me that kind of wishes this was a little more modern and these people would have another shot to do something. You know what I mean? That, that maybe with the right, story idea or financing they could you know make something a little more palatable to to an average viewer but as it stands it would only be something that you would want to watch if you're deep cuts bell witch period, for sure for me yeah. you know yeah so no recommendation no i definitely no. don't recommend it I I, I I would recommend the music i thought the music was yeah, really great no the music it, it got overwrought sometimes because it was used so excessively in for the movie sure. But the music itself is really well done, and I and I again I get the impulse to put it in there, you know. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a fair rating. So yeah, w I guess that ends up being like a solid D. Yeah, which I feel that's fair. For what it's worth, this kicks the shit out of an American Haunting. So, light, I mean, light years, light years better. Yeah. So I mean, if if someone that is involved with this stumbles onto this and listens to it, God bless you, because you you did better than like. You know, a director that had Donald Sutherland. You right. know what I mean? So you, you, you can definitely put that in your hat. You know, that's a feather in your cap for sure. So, yeah, definitely. Con congrats on that level. Every episode of The Holler Kings, we do a segment entitled Holler at Your Boys. Holler at your boys, y'all. It's true. Even in this eccentric Bell Witch era, we're doing Holler at Your Boys. And today, we're going to visit some personal Bell Witch stories. Yes, sir, we are. Because the spirit is still haunting Middle Tennessee to this day. So therefore, it's we all have. around us. Ah! So therefore, we have modern stories and modern people that have been touched by the spirit. The Holler Kings present The Bell Witch Legend Personal Stories uh. It's true <laughs> So before we open the floor to some listener uh, submissions uh, Do you have any personal Bell Witch stories, Mr. Um, Adam? I d not, j I mean, other than the type of stuff we've kind of covered uh, No, I don't really have much I, I did have one thing that was pointed out to me by my father. This isn't like a haunting or anything like this. It's just kind of how uh, the Bell Witch legend has kind of set with us. We kind of grew up in it. I forgot all about this. When I told him that we were going to be doing these podcasts about the Bell Witch um, and reviewing some Bell Witch movies, he was like, oh, man, that's he was like, that's cool. He's like, you know what you jokingly, he said it, but he's like, you know what you should do? Y'all should review your movie. And I had completely forgot that this had to be back back before my grandfather passed away, which was 2009. We used to go like every like every Christmas, every Thanksgiving, we would go over to his house and it would be like there my dad and his sister would be all of our families coming together to to my grandparents' house, his his parents. You know, we would spend all day there, like on Christmas and stuff like that, uh, opening presents, you know, eating and stuff. We basically had breakfast, lunch, dinner there. Mm. It was me, my sister, and then my aunt, her three kids. So it was, it was five of us there. You know, we're all young kids, so we would get bored and play and stuff like that. And at one point over the years, they ended up getting like a little camera. Uh, just like one of those SVHS or something like that 
cameras. And so we would like record ourselves just doing silly shit, lip syncing songs, doing little sketches, whatever. <laughs> we would we would just, you know, do whatever. And one year this had to have been it had to have been December of ninety nine because we did a movie called The Bell Witch Project. Oh so uh, it had, like I said, it had to been ninety nine because we were inspired. I was inspired by Blair Witch, obviously, to do that. And so, yeah, we did the Bell Witch Project movie, and uh, it was awful. Well, I mean, it's made by children, <laughs> but, yeah. but yeah, but I had forgot all about it. So yeah, it's kind of just where how that legend kind of is ingrained in us. Like that. That's my first thought is to do the Bell Witch, not do just like a rip off or parody of the Blair Witch, but do the Bell Witch. Mm. I was like, oh man, wow, I forgot all about that. Well, I think that's something worth noting is like, in one of the stories that a listener sent is is in this kind of genre, where a lot of Middle Tennesseans, when you grow up around here, the Bell Witch is almost like part of play. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like uh, some of the, like the mirror legend where you say the name and the Bell Witch will, you know, appear to you in the mirror and I mean, it's kind of just built into our DNA for, you know, we just play yeah. with this idea and everything. So it's just really part of our culture here. Did you have anything else? The only thing I can think of is kind of related to that where, again, you know, everybody around here knows a kid that claimed they summoned the Bell Witch and the Bell Witch attacked them. And, right. you yeah. know, they have a scar on their face. And, you know, I had a friend named Chad that... <laughs> claimed uh, the Bell Witch scratched him on the face, and it was a chicken pox scar. But oh, he yeah. would claim that that was, you know, from uh, the Bell Witch. That was hard, man. But but I mean, I remember the, the the mirror story scared the shit out of me, and I would never do it. I would never have the balls to do it. Even the variations, because there's variations where if you say you love the Bell Witch five times in a mirror, right. she will appear and just be normal. Yeah. But if you say that you hate the Bell Witch, she would appear in the mirror and attack you. Yeah. Um, but that was so ingrained in me that by the time I saw Candyman, uh, I thought Candyman ripped off the Bell Witch. Right. Like yeah. I saw that movie and I was like, oh, they just, they ripped off <laughs> us. You know, and little did I know that obviously Bloody Mary is the uh, originator of the mirror legend. So we, we technically just stole it from another culture anyway. Right. And yeah. kind of made our own. And has no actual relation to the Bell Witch. No. It was just, it's no. our legend. So. Yeah. So we just kind we of went with that. married together a couple of things. But I've always I, been fascinated by it. Yeah. yeah. Before we get on those, I just want to touch on two things real quick. They kind of are related. Did you know there's a band called Bell Witch? I, only because I was searching around and yeah. I stumbled on it. Yeah. I didn't know before. Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't either. I kind of stumbled on it too, looking around mm -hmm. and stuff. And I was like, oh, well, I mean, they're not, they're like a, from Seattle. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> not, not Southern at all, but. It's, it's public domain. So yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I listened to one of their albums. It's, uh, what do they call it? The specific genre is called Funeral Doom, oh, which I don't know that. what that is. But yeah. I mean, the, the, I like the music. It's very like ambiance style, very, uh. I don't even know how to describe it. I guess funeral doom is how I would mm. describe it. So I don't know. No, I, I thought it was. I thought it was good though. The other thing, I would. I'm really curious. Cause I came across a little bit of stuff while doing like with while like researching and everything. Have you heard anything about how the Bell Witch carries over the legend carries over to Mississippi? No, not at all. Yeah, I I found some of that while researching. There's a whole little legend about it. Betsy, of course, moved to Mississippi in her later years. And ended up passing away there, obviously. There is this legend around it that John uh, T. Bell, the grandson of John Bell, were supposedly tormented by the Bell Witch there, too, in, let's see, Panola and Yalobusha counties. And basically, the, the legend is that uh, John T. Bell's daughter, Mary, fell in love with someone named uh, Gerald and... John T. Bell was against this uh, relationship and ended up supposedly killing Gerald. Hmm. 
And after that, Mary became like really upset and uh, sick and ended up falling into a sort of like coma kind of. And after a while, uh, she woke up suddenly, exclaimed that she was going to be with Gerald and then died. And then supposedly after that, like um, while they were taking her body, like the casket, I guess, to uh, bury it, there was like this huge dark bird that was like flying around the like around the carriage that was taking her and stayed flying around until like every last bit of dirt was on the grave and then flew off and supposedly there's like all like odd little hauntings and things that have happened there so i i found that interesting i wonder in those areas of mississippi is that legend as prominent as like the bell witches here to us sure yeah, I, well, and it fits with the mythology, too, because mm-hmm. obviously she's omnipresent. So, yeah. yeah. I thought that was interesting. It was just, I, I didn't come across a whole, a whole lot about it, but I found that interesting. I was just, I, I wonder if kind of, they kind of take, have the legend as strong as we do, mm-hmm. or if it's kind of just something maybe some people know, some people don't. It might or be whatnot. like super regional, too, yeah. you know? Yeah, I figured just maybe those specific counties or right. whatnot, but... Huh. I thought that was interesting. Definitely. But that's all I got. I guess we're going to go with uh, chronological order. The first is a interview I did with my father. And just for, uh, you know, a little bit of context, my dad was part of a very tough biker gang called the Shackle Island Boys oh, shit. in this era. So you, he was a tough dude. Not at all. I'll I'll drop in some pictures of him. He was just like a fun-loving kid. But uh, he visited the Bell Witch Cave uh, playing hooky as a teenager. Oh, really? Yeah, this would be in the 60s. So uh, it's a pretty interesting story. I got uneasy during the story just because it was on a family game night, and my mom and my wife were there, and they were giggling and laughing at me, you know, wanting to do this interview and stuff. And there was a piece of me that was getting worried because the whole thing about disrespecting the Bell Witch, oh, you know really? what I mean? Yeah. Like, there was a small little lizard part of me that was like, uh, guys, kind of like, yeah. you know, kind of <laughs> take it down a notch, whatever. <laughs> she so, may hear you. Yeah. It was either late 69 or early 70, 19. How 16. old would you have been? 16. When we went, it was three, three other guys that we skipped school, actually, and went. To go up there. It was just somebody had talked about going up there and we all decided we was going to go. What did you know about the Bell Witch before you went out there? The only thing we knew at the time we went was it was supposed to be in a haunted cave or a haunted property. So we said, well, we're going to go up there and see what it's all about. And it was cool weather. I do remember that part of it because we had jackets on. When we went up there, it was owned by a private owner at that time. And we had to see him before we could you know, go in the cave. He, he wouldn't let anybody in, just you had to ask permission to go. And he told us about some stuff that it went on while he was there. You know, he said it would, you know, sometimes it would be uh, just a brush of wind that would come by and he would feel like somebody was touching him, you know, on, a, on his face or whatever, you know. And he, he had heard rumors that other people had told him that this spirit or whatever had pulled their hair or screamed in their ear, but there wouldn't be anybody around. As far as the cave goes, he said, I don't know of anything that's went on in that cave, but that's that's where supposedly they stayed, you know, while they was trying to build the house or whatever the, you know, it, the story goes, it's the way he explained it, that I remember. I mean, you know, he may, it may be a little bit different than that. But when we went in the cave, he said, now you can go in this cave but he said, I'm not taking any responsibility for whatever happens, you know, whatever goes on, you're on your own. Of course, us being 16 years old, we didn't care. But anyway, when we started going in the cave and the, when we got back into the cave and you had to go, it, it started getting smaller. The cave had a pretty good size opening, but as you went in, it went smaller. And he told us when you get to a certain point, you got to get on your belly and crawl a certain amount of length and, and it opens up bigger as you get back and farther in there. Well, we went back in there so far and, and we chickened out because the water is starting to get up in the cave and we was afraid we'd get too far back in there and couldn't get out. Yes, all right. we had was 
flashlights at the time. We didn't think to bring a rope or anything like that to get ourselves back out. And matter of fact, I think one of my lights is still in there. My dad got on to me about losing his <laughs> flashlight. But anyway, uh, one of the guys that was with me, and he swears it happened. Now, I don't know whether it did or not, but he swears it happened. How many of you were there? There's three more guys besides myself. Okay. There's four of us went up there. We were crawling back through there, and when we got to where we could kind of stand up a little bit, you know, and the guy, he said he felt something touch him on the back. Now, whether that happened or not, that's just hard to say, but he was scared enough. He's ready to get out of there. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm coming out. I'm not staying in here. But we stayed up there probably 45 minutes to an hour crawling around in that stuff. Come out of there, just mud all over us. And, you know, it's just ridiculous. Now that I think about it, that was the dumbest thing we could have done because if it had come a rain shower or something, it would have probably filled that cave up mm-hmm. enough that we could have got caught in there or something. So, But I mean, as far as my experience of, of being scared or nothing, as far as the witch bothering me or anything, none of that ever happened. But I wouldn't do it again. Nobody in your group took anything? You know, you hear stories about people taking a rock or something from the cave. No, it, no. We're, like I said, we were 16-year-old kids. We were skipping school. We didn't mm-hmm. we didn't really care about any of the stuff that went on. We just used it as an excuse to go somewhere sure. when, we go, so when we skipped school. <laughs> but it was, it, it, we shouldn't have done it. I'll put it that way. Yeah. So, yeah, my, my father's experience going into the cave back when it was not open for tourists. Yeah, that's it, cool. Yeah. More like... I, I mean, I, I guess kind of more untouched, more mm-hmm. makes it seem more special. And, and and I kind of wonder, you know, talking about like us as kids kind of playing around with the myth. I mean, obviously back then when the cave was open theoretically to anyone, you know, if you had the balls to ask for permission, I mean, that's kind of a form of, you know, solidifying that myth and the folklore yeah. and everything is like there's a tangible place you can go to and, right. you know, and you're almost guaranteed to have some kind of spooky experience in like, a cave that's not professionally lit up mm-hmm. and you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, my dad off mic, he mentioned that the, his dad, my, my grandfather, his dad w- worked for the railroad mm. and the, the light that he was using was like professional uh, railroad lantern. And he ended up dropping it and leaving it when they got scared and left or whatever. And really? his dad was like, what happened to my lantern? Cause it was like a really fancy, yeah. you know, something he used for work and everything. And uh, my dad totally just lied his ass off. I was like, I have no idea. I don't know what I, You know what I mean? <laughs> you it have was one a of those, lantern? Yeah, it was one of those things that like almost became a big issue, but it kind of got dropped or whatever. Here's Dr. Gangreen himself, Larry Underwood, recounting his own Bell Witch experiences. I was just wondering, with you being, you know, a Tennessee, you're a Tennessee native, correct? Yeah. Okay. Do you have any kind of um, like memories of the Bell Witch growing up or just kind of like that aura, you know, that you feel comfortable talking about? Yeah. Like, so, you know, 70s were when I was in school, you know, mm-hmm. born in 66. So I, 70s were my age growing up. And I remember when I was in elementary school, they took us down to the Children's Theater in Nashville and they were doing a play of the Bell Witch. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. And it, at the, during the play, it had a blackout and someone screamed. And I remember, you know, that was just it being such a cool thing. You know, um, kids at school were all freaked out about the Bell Witch and the legend of the Bell Witch. And, of course, I've been up to the cave, the Bell Witch cave mm-hmm. up there and done the tour many times. And it's just one of those cool local legends, you know, that I'm glad exists. Our next story is from a listener that wanted to remain anonymous, but they were kind enough to record it for us. Thanks, Anonymous. Yes. And this takes place in the 1980s. So it's another era jump. It was late October of 1987. There were about five of us girls having a slumber party. We were doing the usual shenanigans, like playing light as a feather, stiff as a board, when one girl decided that we should go into the bathroom and light some candles and look into the mirror and pledge our allegiance to the Bell Witch. So each girl went in one at a time and looked in the mirror and said, I love the Bell Witch. I love the Bell Witch. I love the Bell Witch. But when it was my turn, I went into the bathroom and I said, I hate the Bell Witch. I hate the Bell Witch. I hate the Bell Witch. 
nothing happened that night, but the next night, one of the girls and I went to um, a fall festival at one of the churches. And she and I decided that we were going to sneak into the church while everything was going on outside. And as we entered into the church, the lights started flickering and things started falling off shelves. We had never been so terrified in our entire lives. And we just knew that it was because I told the Bell Witch that I hated her. Actually, I really like the ambience of that, like yeah. the crickets in the background. Like and every, yeah, yeah, it felt very like campfire-y and right. like camping and ghost stories around the campfire. That, that was cool. <laughs> this isn't related, but I'm fascinated. She said it was like 87. Yeah. And they were playing Light as a Feather, Stiff as a Board. Mm -hmm. That kind of blows my mind. I thought that was like a thing from the craft. No, that's like a really common sleepover thing. That's why. why. I wonder where it originates from then. Because I'd I'd never heard of it till the craft. So Mm -hmm. I was just like, and then I heard about it so much after that, I just assumed that's where it came from. I'm sure that helped popularize it. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Especially people your age. um, it, it's kind of interesting because I did notice the listener didn't go all the way when they were repeating. Because in the urban legend, you're supposed to say it five, five times. times yeah. She never did it either way when she was recounting the story. So maybe she yeah. was kind of uh, covering her bases <laughs> and not, not going all the way <laughs> with it in safe. the moment. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it also kind of fits back in with the idea that the witch can go anywhere, or the spirit can go anywhere. And churches are one of their favorite haunts because it kind of like culminates, you know, in her going to a church. And yeah. that's where, you know, a disturbance happens or whatever. Mm-hmm. So it all checks out with, with the mythology. It does. So pretty cool. And I could totally see where, you know, a young person, their imagination could get away from oh, them yeah. if they if they actually went down that route. For and, sure. Uh, I've never heard of a pledge allegiance to the Bell Witch, by the no. way. I thought that was an interesting phrasing. <laughs> yeah, that was a, that's what that's what I thought. I was like, "Oh shit, yeah." <laughs> some some kids of the era were all like, "Bell witch, we will serve you." Let's do some <laughs> sacrificing for the bell witch. <laughs> okay, so our last story is uh, from a listener and friend. Uh, this is Mark O. Estes, and he is the host of his own podcast called uh, Midnight Social Distortion, and highly recommended. And also, uh, he is the member of a podcast crew called the Scream Kings with a Z. Oh, shit. Yeah, it's all true. But uh, he has a story, and it's uh, from the 90s. So we're kinda... Now, you, you didn't, I don't think, did you, I don't think you just mentioned it. Is he from Tennessee? Oh, that's a great point. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, and what was interesting to me is that he is in Memphis, so it's it's skewed a little bit differently. You yes. know what I mean? Like us in Middle Tennessee, Nashville area, this is like embedded in us. Whereas we're in the w- yeah, yeah, we're in the heart of it. When you go outside of Middle Tennessee, this becomes much more obscure. So it's kind of interesting to hear someone that's still pretty close their experience with it. When it comes to the Bell Witch, my first discovery of the legend was actually during 1999 and during the Blair Witch Project craze. Um, I was a student librarian and of course I was engorged in everything Blair Witch. I looked up the website when I had the opportunity. Um, I would just, anything that came out, I was on it like, you know, flies on crap. So it boggled me to find out that while working at my library, I came across not only the fact that the Blair Witch Project was a hoax, or not really a hoax, but a uh, very smart marketing campaign to get people interested into the movie. And I took that knowledge and tried to spread it to other people who actually thought it was real. But in the process of doing that, I came across something called the Bell Witch. And that shocked me, but what shocked me even more was the fact that this took place in Tennessee. And my whole attention span turned from trying to spread the word that the Blair Witch was a um, marketing employee, but, and it went towards trying to find out everything I could find about the Bell Witch of Adams, Tennessee. 
the problem was that even though I was in the library trying to research everything, there was not one book in the library that was that catered to history about the Bell Witch. And even in our geneal, um, genealogical area, there was nothing in that um, section that had anything to do with the Bell Witch. I looked up file cabinets. I looked at uh, microfish film and couldn't find anything. Usually we would have basically um, uh, an index of sorts to look for stuff of that kind in the genealogical er um, area, but it had nothing in there where we can look. And one of the reasons that was was because most of the stuff that they did have was not brought back. It was not it was either extracted from the genealogical section without knowledge um, illegally or whatever books that we had on the subject of the bell, which were not brought back. So they were like considered lost. And so I had to just dig when I could elsewhere. And I finally came across a copy of the authenticated history of the bell, Witch, which was written by, I want to, I forgot the name of the author, but I got a copy of the Red Book. And that's been my way of finding out about the Bell Witch. Um, I did try to procure a copy of An American Haunting. And to be honest with you, I haven't seen it all the way through yet. But it's still chilling to know that Tennessee has a legend of sorts dealing with the Bell Witch. Right on. That was yeah. thanks, Mark. That was awesome. That's it's, that's interesting how a legend can kind of just it reaches a certain like point and then kind of just drops off in like how far it travels. I guess. Yeah. So I, I wonder if that's kind of how it is outside of Middle Tennessee. It's kind of not really known. I mean, I can only imagine that it, that's how it is unless you're like really into. You know, paranormal stuff yeah. and everything. Yeah. And, and I guess it's something we should probably acknowledge. I mean, everywhere has the regional ghost stories and For hauntings. Sure. So, you know, it, it feels like the Bell Witch is like the center of the universe <laughs> with paranormal stuff to me. Yeah. But the reality is it's a pretty obscure outside of Tennessee story. I mean, there are stories, you know, like around here of like ghosts and stuff, mm -hmm. like around the square and like. Civil, you know, Civil War soldiers like haunting it and stuff. It's just that that this legend is so unique in the way it took place and how everything supposedly happened. It 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 it, it heightens that kind of legend and our embr us embracing it more. Yeah, and kind of keeping it alive, I guess. Well, and I think the fact that the Bell Witch doesn't have a direct source, so it's totally open to speculation as to what it is, right. helps a lot. For like sure. If it, if it was a traditional ghost that's like the spirit of a dead person, it wouldn't be nearly as compelling, uh, yeah. I believe. So uh, that definitely helps augment the story. We wouldn't have four m movies and countless documentaries, Do documentaries. There's about a ton it. Of, yeah. that, that's one thing that was really interesting is, is how many people came forward to me saying, you get, you should watch this documentary, this show. And I was just like, I just don't have the time. Like yeah, I'm already watching all these movies, reading all these books. I just can't quite, you know, you sent me a couple that, that I d definitely looked at. Yeah. The Zach Adams one. That, um, that's been the only one I, I like kind of skimmed through some other ones. Yeah. That was basically the only one I actually watched. Um, and just because it was Nashville Bay, I mean, you know, it was Tennessee based from a Tennessee filmmaker. The other ones are like, you know, ones from like Travel Channel and stuff like that. But there, I mean, there's a ton of them out there. We did have a few people slip into the DMs basically saying, you know, I wish I had a Bell Witch story, you know, that type of thing. And, and I don't think they, I, I hope, I guess I didn't make it clear enough that it was okay if it was more just like what you knew of the Bell Witch right, growing up. Yeah. I mean, I was kind of interested in any story like that. Like, I really like Mark's, mm -hmm. just his discovery of it and then going into like research mode. He yeah, was almost that's like, awesome. He's almost like a Lovecraftian character, you know, going to the library and going through all the yeah, you like know, true research. Re yeah, it's not, yeah. it was 1999. It's not like <laughs> research now where you just like, I'm going to lay on the couch and Google right. everything. Right. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, 
So yeah, and also it's probably worth noting too that Blair Witch probably revitalized interest in, in the Bell yeah. Witch because so many of these books that I've been reading and looking at and references are from eras that are pretty close to the Blair Witch Project coming out. So, right. You know what I mean? I think that definitely helped interest peak. And they, they actually mentioned the Bell Witch in the Blair Witch Project uh, documentary that they made on sci-fi. Right. Like yeah, that the curse faux, of the Bell, yeah, Blair like, Witch. Which, for those of you that don't remember, it was like a faux mockumentary type of thing proposing what happened to these kids out in... Yeah. You know, so it was made to look real, but they mentioned specifically the Bell Witch in that show. So Probably, yeah. I think that definitely piqued a lot of people's interest. For sure. And that with birth of the internet and everything. Mm. So, yeah, probably confluence of events that really revitalized it thank you guys for uh, submitting your stories thank yes, you to my so father much. for going down memory lane and thank you for listening to our further adventures into the bell witch haunting yes next week we are reviewing our final bell witch movie yes which is actually called the bell witch haunting yes from, from 2004 ish yes yes it is the Bell, Bell Witch Haunting, 2004. Unfortunately, the same title as a, another movie. Yeah, that we the 2013 at. one. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's, that's why. That's why I emphasize the year because they are the <laughs> same title. And this one, guys, I'm sorry. It's pretty. It's pretty r- hard to find. There is a website where you can order a copy. That website looks like it hasn't been touched since 2004. I mean, it's still active. It's still live. Someone's paying for the domain name. Yeah, so there is that positive. But I guess at your own risk, buying it, it's also like $25. There there are like two copies that are on Amazon that you can buy for like $15 or something. Mm. But it's a tough tough one to track down. It's not Mm. streaming anywhere at all. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you. Uh, please reach out to us on social media. That is the Holler Kings on Instagram and Twitter. And you can email us at thehollerkings at gmail.com. Yes. And don't forget to check us out on YouTube if you're listening to this. But if you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to like us and leave a comment and subscribe. Please do it all. Thanks for listening. Adam, thank you for joining me. Thank you, sir. Y'all come back now, you hear? Ooh. I can't leave, but I use my karate. <laughs>